Hello, and welcome back to Give Me the Bible. This is a series that is a Kenneth Cox production that is coming to you live from 3ABN's Worship Center. And we're so thankful that he is here. We are very thankful for this series. It's a five-part series called The Elisha Message. And we're just grateful that all of our brothers and sisters from around the world are joining us. You know, we've had a wonderful time during this series, haven't we? We began... Uh, Pastor Cox began talking about the, the message was the coming of Elisha, and we learned that John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and I believe that Pastor Cox is coming with that same spirit and power to give us this much-needed message. And then his second part was on Abraham's altar, the importance of family worship, morning and evening, and what an impact that makes on the salvation of your family. Then we heard, bless this house. And what was the takeaway from that? That God's love is unconditional, but boy, those promises are conditioned on on obedience, aren't they? You know, Hebrews 10.36 says that we have need of endurance so that after we have done the will of God, we will receive his promise. And tonight, Kenneth is going to bring us heaven is my home. And I'm very anxious to hear that message. But before he comes out to speak, it's my very distinct honor to introduce to you Donna Klein. You usually see Donna behind the organ, but tonight we're going to get to hear Donna sing, and she's going to be singing a Roy Drusky song. Roy traveled with Kenneth Cox Ministries for over 10 years, and this is a song that says, Lord, help me slow down this life of mine. Thank you, Donna. slow down this life of mine help me make better use of precious time let me taste the grapes but make me tend the vine Lord help me slow down this life of mine Help me find my purpose in this world today. Help me help a stranger who's lost along the way. If someone really needs me, make me take the time. Lord, help me slow down this life of mine. Lord, help me slow down this life of mine. Help me make better use of precious time. Let me taste the grapes, but make me tend the vine. Lord, help me slow down this life of mine. Thank you, Donna Klein. Slow down this life of mine. I guess that's something that all of us need to do is slow down our lives just a little bit and stop and smell the th roses and the things that God has to offer. Well, good evening. Very happy to welcome all of you again 
Appreciate you being here. Forgive me, the Bible. Those of you that are joining us by television or listening on the radio, we welcome you also. Glad to have you, and we hope that as we're going into this series on the Elijah message, that it's helping you understand what is taking place and what we need to be doing. That little poem that I try to share with you is something that we have to keep our minds focused on. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible, this my only question be. The message of Elijah offers guidance to us, to you and me. What says the Word of God to me? This is what we have to find out. It's what does God's Word have for us, each one? Well, we've looked at several subjects on the Elijah message, and uh, we found out that it is dealing with the home, and we've looked at some aspects of the home. Tonight, we're looking at heaven is my home, because actually, that's Elijah's home right now, is heaven. That's what the Scripture says. So, we're taking a look at heaven is my home. Our closing subject on this series is entitled, The Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord. The Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord. Because that's what the Scripture says there in Malachi. It says that he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And he says he will do that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, we're going to look at that in our next presentation, what's talking about how can I, or how can you as an individual, be prepared for that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Very important that we look at it, understand what God is telling each one of us. Tonight, heaven is my home. Uh, you know, it's hard to comprehend. It's hard to imagine all the wonderful things that God has prepared for us. You know, uh, we, we have a tendency to think of it just in concerning the things around us. But what God has prepared is so, so much more. And so I hope tonight to be able to take your minds off this old world and really put them on where your home is. Because if you're a follower of the Lord and you're His people, then He has a home for you, a special place. And that's what we're going to look at this evening. Time short. It's running out. Uh, can't continue on. It's just coming to an end. And it's closing up, folks, and Christ is coming back. And we need to be prepared for that. And Donna's going to sing about that tonight in a song entitled, Almost Home. It's fake gold and silver Tempting me to give up the race Close the door, Lord, behind me On these things that bind me Then remind me again That I In search of a world without end, I'm almost home where Jesus is waiting, where angels are singing, and where I'll never more roam. Hallelujah! I'm almost home. The sick 
darkness and dying with its sadness and crying will all be a thing of the past this old world and its sorrow makes me long for tomorrow when all things will be new at last no more heartaches or grieving for soon I Gracious Lord, tonight we anxiously look forward to that day when you're coming back and all of us will be at home. Grant us understanding, wisdom, insight that we may see the wondrous things that you have provided and that we might purpose in our hearts and in our souls to walk with you, to follow you, to do your bidding and your will. Give us, Lord, the insight that we need tonight that our minds and our hearts may look for a new city, a new place where God dwells. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Christ was talking to his disciples, and he made rather a startling statement, one that uh, really, if you're just reading through the Scripture and you don't follow it, it seems like something he said that wasn't possible. This is what he said. But I tell you, truly, there are some of you standing here who shall not taste death till you see the kingdom of God. Oh, he said, his disciples, he said, there, there's some of you standing here that will not see death until you see the kingdom of God. What was he talking about? What is he referring to? Well, the Scripture goes on and explains it, as it always does. If, if you just pick up the Word of God and you spend enough time in it, it will explain it. You just have to keep studying. And watch as it explains exactly what he was talking about. It came to pass about what? Eight days later. <laughs> about eight days later, these sayings that he took... Peter and John and James went up in the mountain to pray. So here we are eight days later, and he takes Peter and James and John up on the mountain, and when he's up there, he is transfigured, because it says here, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. They're there on the mountain with him, and here he is praying and all of a sudden, his appearance begins to change, and his clothing 
becomes bright and shining. And the whole thing begins to change. And all of a sudden, two people are with him. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. This Elijah that we've been talking about, the message, here he is with Christ on this mountain. And by the way, I've had people say, oh, that was a vision. No, that's not a vision. That isn't what it says here. It says that Moses and Elijah were with him. So they're there on the mountain with him talking to Christ. And there the glory of God shone forth in all of its beauty. And those disciples were frightened and afraid because of the glory that was involved there. Why would Moses and Elijah come and meet with him? Why were they there? Well, it says this about Moses. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. You remember the Lord told Moses, he said, Moses, you're not going to go into the land of Canaan, but come up here on top of the mountain, Mount Nebo, and I will show you the land of Canaan, which God showed him, the whole land of Canaan. And then it says, he told Moses, you're going to, rest now. You're going to die. And he died. And where was he buried? Now listen, because it tells you where he was buried, okay? And he buried him in a where? Not on Mount Nebo, folks. Buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. So it says that he took Moses and buried him here in a valley opposite of Beth Peor. And nobody knows where his grave is to this day. So Moses died. Elijah, and it says concerning Moses, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a revealing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. He said that Michael came. What he's disputing with the devil about over the body of Moses and what is happening here is we have just found that Moses is on the mount of transfiguration with Christ. So this dispute has to be over the resurrection of Moses. You know, I've thought about that. What a wonderful thing that is. You see, God said, okay, Moses, because you lost your temper and because you uh, did things you shouldn't, you can't go over in the land of Canaan. And, and this is, he has spent 40 years, folks, getting these people there. And to say, now you can't go over, which he told him he couldn't. And he died. But you see, God had something much better in mind. He said, uh, listen, Moses, we're going to resurrect you, take you to the heavenly Canaan. See? So this was what the dispute was that, of the resurrection of Moses and brought back, taken to heaven. Elijah, we read, then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So it says that Elijah didn't die, that he was taken to heaven without seeing death. And so you have Moses and Elijah there with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. What does it represent? Well, listen, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a... Shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, two groups here, watch. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So you have 
Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah represents all those that are living when Jesus comes. Moses represents all those who have died that will be resurrected. And thus Christ could tell the disciples, there's some of you who will not see death until you see the Son of Man coming. So in miniature, Peter, James, and John saw the coming of the Lord and those of the righteous who have been resurrected and those who were translated. So you have both of them there. And Moses and Elijah have spent now 2,000 years or better in heaven, enjoying all the wonders of heaven. What has God prepared for you? What's it like? What's this place that God has made? What's it like for each one of us? Well, let's take a look at what the Scripture says. But as, at it, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? Love him. It says the most beautiful scene you have ever seen will not compare to heaven. The most beautiful music you have ever heard will not compare to the music of heaven. In fact, it says that you can't imagine what it will be like. Now, folks, you know, uh, that's kind of different because when I was a kid, I can remember I went to school way out in the country in, in a little brick schoolhouse that had four grades in each room. And, I mean, way out on a dirt road, way out there. And, and I don't know what happened, but somehow, some way, this circus uh, got lost. And it wound up on this dirt road coming by our school, you know. And, uh, and of course, all of us kids were looking at these trucks as they went by because they had all these animals and all these things on it. And then when we went to town... Here were signs plastered up all over saying the circus was coming to town. Well, b man, for the next two weeks in school, that's what we played. Every recess was circus. And I mean, we had all kinds of things. We had people swinging from trapezes and doing flips like you couldn't believe. I mean, our imaginations went way, way there. And then when the two weeks was up and the circus came to town, we went to the circus it wasn't near as good as our imagination. <laughs> See? But the Scripture says you can't do that with heaven. You can't imagine anything that will be greater than what heaven will be. So God has wonderful things, marvelous things in store for you and for me. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. So this city is up in heaven. It's going to come back to this old earth. The city is laid out as a square. Okay? Very clear. It's laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed. 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal, meaning in proportion. So the city is laid out in a square. It's in proportion. And it says that it is 12,000 furlongs around the city. There are eight furlongs in a mile. So if you divide eight into 12,000, what do you got? You've got 1,500 miles around that city. 375 miles on a side because it's laid out in a square. You see, we don't have any cities like that. We do have a state that's almost exactly that size, the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado is almost exactly 375 miles on each side. And so, if you look at the state of Colorado, you can just put the New Jerusalem in there. 
You see, we don't have anything like that. I mean, have you ever been to New York? Uh, you can walk across the city of New York the, the short way without any trouble. And in the city of New York, well, how many people are there? Huh? Well, about 23 million. That's how many are in New York. And, and it doesn't even start to be that size. So when we got a city that's 375 miles on a side, I mean that holds lots of people, a lot of people, okay? In fact, there's room in that city for every man, woman, and child that has ever lived. So don't let me hear you say there's not room for you. Because there is room for you there in that city that he's made for us. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at each gate, and the name written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So around this city is this wall, 375 miles on a side, okay? And in it, in that wall are three gates, okay? And it goes on and says three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So there's three gates on each side of the city. And over the top of each gate is one of the names of the tribes of Israel. Have you ever thought about that? Why? Why over each gate is there one of the names of the tribes of Israel? Now, you know, you've got to go through one of the gates. You can't crawl over the wall. You, you've got to go through one of those gates. What gate are you going to go through? Well, I don't have time to go in it tonight, but if you went back and did some study, you'll find in the last chapter of Genesis, Jacob tells the characteristics of his son. And all of us, fit into one of those tribes by our personalities. And according to your character and your personality, you will go in through that gate into the city. That's the reason you have the name of each tribe over one of those gates. No, because it's a, it's a city for all nations, not just the 12 tribes. But we will go in according to our personality. And it says... Then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is an angel. So it says he measured the wall of a city, and the wall is 144 cubits high, according to a man or an angel. How much is a cubit? Well, I'll tell you how much a cubit is. A cubit is this from here to there. That's a cubit, okay? Okay about 20 inches. So it tells you that that wall is over 200 feet high. Over 200 feet high, 375 miles long on each side, and in each side there are three gates. Listen what it says about these gates. And twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. Now, folks, you don't have walls over 200 feet high and 375 miles long and have little teeny gates. I mean, it just doesn't fit. Architecturally, it doesn't fit. Those have to be huge gates, and each gate is made out of one pearl. And standing at each gate is an angel, okay? So that's the walls around the city. Not only the walls around the city, but it also tells us about the foundations. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them... Were, were the 12 apostles. On those 12 gates, on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So 
on each foundation is the name of one of the apostles. And it tells you that those foundations are made out of 12 precious stones. What they're made out of. And it says, the foundation of the wall of the city was adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was like jasper. The second was sapphire. The third was chaldonsi. And the fourth was emerald. And it tells each one. You want to have an interesting study? Go home tonight. Get your Bible and turn over here to Revelation 21. And then get your dictionary and look up each one of those stones, and you'll find those 12 stones make up the color of the rainbow. That's what they make up, the color of the rainbow. And so the city has this foundation of 12 stones that make up the color of the rainbow, and on each one is one of the name of the apostles. So we have the city begins to give us what it's like. And it says the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lord is its light. Now, folks, it goes on here and says, Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. Now, it doesn't say that there won't be a sun or there won't be a moon. That isn't what that says. It says there was no need of it because he's the light of it. Christ is there. He's the light of that city. And it says there's no night there. Therefore, the gates of the city are never shut because there's no night there. So the gates of the city are open and all. No, Peter doesn't have the keys to the gates, and he's not going to be standing there. It says the gates will all be open, and all the righteous will come and go because there will be no sin there. There will be nothing that would hurt nor destroy in all of God's kingdom. So there's no reason for the gates not to be open, open to all mankind. And he showed me a pure river, water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And so out of God's throne flows this river as clear as crystal. Now, can you just imagine when John wrote this, he said it was pure river, water of life, clear as crystal. Now, folks, if John is emphasizing it's clear as crystal, you know, we understand that because everything we have is polluted. But it wasn't in John's day. And so when he's saying it's clear as crystal, you better believe it is really clear as crystal. And can you just imagine water that has never, not even the least bit of tint of pollution in it, how wonderful it must taste. No chemicals in it, just as it flows from the throne of God, the water of life that all of us will be able to drink of. And it tells us that on each side of that river, and in the middle of the street, on either side of the river was the tree of life, okay, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So it says this tree of life spans the river of life, and it grows, and it bears its fruit. How often? Every month. Bears its fruit every month. I had one person tell me, tell me that that was 12 varieties of mangoes. But <laughs> I, I, I really don't know that that's true, folks. It just says that it bears its fruit every month. And so the righteous will come and eat of the tree of life every month. Okay? This is the tree of life. I don't have time to talk about it tonight, but... This is the one that was in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that? It's coming back in the New Jerusalem. We'll be there. This is the tree that perpetuates immortality that you and I will have the privilege of eating of. Blessed are those that do his commandments that they may have right to what? The tree of life. 
and may enter through the gates into the city. So it says those people that keep God's commandments, they will have right to the tree of life and be able to eat of that tree. All right. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I've talked about this several times during these series, how that God wants to make a covenant with you. And the covenant that he wants to make with you is he says, I will be your God, you shall be my people. And he says, as we talked about in our last presentation, that if you will keep my commandments and do my will, then it will be well with you. Okay? And not only will it be well with you, friend, but it won't be well with you for a day. It will not be well with you for a week or for a year, but it will be well with you for eternity. Because why? Because you are his people, and he is your God. And so I walk with him, and I follow him, and he says, I will give this to you. And after my skin is destroyed, we die. We return back to the dust. This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Wonderful text. Jesus said, if you believe this, even though a man may die, he shall live. You see, even though my flesh is destroyed, even though it decays, then it says that he's going to come and he's going to shout and all the dead in the grave are going to hear his voice and they're going to come forth and they're going to come forth, folks, with bodies, with real bodies. Just be a great difference. Those bodies will be perfect. It says this mortal shall put on immortality. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. They will be perfect as we come forth from the grave. Okay? Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job is saying, oh, I long for that day when that's going to happen, when the Lord is going to come, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So it makes it clear that this body of ours is going to be transformed into his, like his glorious body. What was Christ like when he came forth in the grave? Was he a spirit just floating around? Huh? No. Listen to what it says. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Christ all of a sudden here appeared before the disciples after the resurrection, and uh, they were afraid. I mean, they thought they had seen a ghost. He said, why, why are you having these doubts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He said, you know, why are you afraid? Spirit doesn't have fle flesh and bones as you see I have. But while they did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? <laughs> he was hungry. He said, have you got something to eat? And you see, Christ was very, very real, folks. It says that we will have bodies like his glorious body. So we're going to be real people, just as real as we are here, except we will not be cumbered with disease or pain or any of those things. That will all 
be gone. See? Promises. And there and they shall see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. Be wonderful. Have you ever thought about what it's going to be to be in heaven and to reach out and take somebody's hand and find it to be God's hand? Oh. To look to look in his face and to see him. I think of that song we sing. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. What a wonderful day that will be when I can look and see my Savior and what he has done for you and for me. Well, this can be your home, folks. That's a decision that you can make. You can decide, this is going to be my home. This is where I'm going to be. What will it be like? Well, it says this. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I what? I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he promises that he's gone to heaven, and he's prepared a place for each one of you. For each one of us. A place that Christ himself has prepared. So, uh, you know, you have a home in heaven. That's just as real as anything there is. You know, the Bible says that we're to become like little children. Or you won't get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, those of you that have had children, have you ever had the experience where you promised the kids something? that you get them something, and, and they start claiming it before you've ever had a chance to go buy it? You ever had that problem? Boy, my kids were that way. I mean, if I told them I was going to get them a bicycle, you better believe that they had it as far as they were concerned. There was no question about it. They had it. Well, the same thing's true with the Lord. If he promises you a home, you can claim it because it says that he will not fail. God cannot lie. So if he says, I've prepared a place for you, claim it, dear friends. It belongs to you. God promised it. You can have it. But he goes on, and he makes another statement, and he says this. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of it. Eat the fruit. They shall build, build houses. They shall not build another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. So it says that we're going to be able to build a home. Are, are you catching what that's saying? Huh? Are you getting what that's saying? Because it just got through saying that Jesus is preparing a place for you. This is saying you're going to build a home. So what it's telling you is you're going to have two homes. You're going to have a home inside the new Jerusalem that Christ has made with his own hands. But then in the earth made new, you're going to have a home out in the country that you will build. Listen as it goes on. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. So you're going to build houses and inhabit them. You're going to plant vineyards, eat the fruit of them. You're not going to be there in inactivity. Activity, friends, you know, can't be like the fellow that woke up in heaven, you know, and looked around and everything was beautiful. I mean, gorgeous. And uh, walked around and took in all the scenery and all. And uh, a after a while, somebody came by, said, oh, are you okay? And he said, yes. And they said, would you like anything? He said, I'm a little hungry. And they said, just a minute. They went and got him something to eat and ate it. A few hours passed, and uh, he just sitting there, and somebody came by and said, are you doing okay? And he said, yeah, I'm doing fine. And they said, uh, anything you need? And he said, no. And after a while, they brought him some more food, and he ate it. And This went on for two or three days. 
And finally, he went to one of them, and he said, listen, I, I'd like something to do. Uh, you got something I, I can do. I, I want to do something. And they said, no, there's nothing you can do here. He said, just enjoy it. Walked around. After a while, he went to him. and he said, listen, I enjoy this, and it's beautiful and all, but I really would like to do something. Do you have something? Do you have something I can do? And they said, no, there's nothing here to do. You, nothing you can do. He said, I'd rather be in hell. And they said, where do you think you are? <laughs> well, heaven's not that way. They, you're not going to be inactive. It says we'll build houses, we'll inhabit them, we'll plant vineyards, eat the fruit of them. The wilderness shall and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Marvelous. We'll build houses and have them. Man, I've already started. I've already started making plans. Uh, I'm planning on going. You know? I just think when you're not limited, you're not limited by time, you can, you know, as long as you want, take as long as you want to build it. You're not limited by resources because you can make it out of anything, okay? The city's made out of pure gold, so you can build it out of anything you want to, and, and you can have anything you want to. So, man, I've already started I, in my living room, I'm going to have one whole wall that's solid diamonds, that whole wall. And the wall on the other side is going to be made out of living roses. Uh, just think of how that will look and flecked in that diamond wall and how nice it will smell. Anything you want to think of, you can do. There's no limit. It says, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it in the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellent excellency of our God. Wonderful will be the things that he's prepared for his people. And God will wipe away every tear from your eye. Folks, heartache, sorrow, crying will be no more. To wipe away every tear from your eyes. There shall be no more death, sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. All that, gone. Never happen again. This will become the home of God's people. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters that cover the sea. See, anything will be there. Everything will be in harmony. Nothing will hurt nor destroy in all of God's kingdom. The animals won't be vicious. Animals will be tame. You and I can pet them. They'll be kind. I can remember when first church... I ever pastored. I took my family and we drove into this little town of Delhart, Texas. And uh, as we drove into the town, my daughter said to me, we went by a little, a little private zoo. And she said, Daddy, take me to the zoo. And I said, Honey, when we get home and we get all settled and everything, I'll take you to the zoo. So, I don't remember, several weeks later, we had gotten our house all settled and everything. One day I said to her, I said, would you like to go to the zoo? And she said, oh, yes. And so uh, we went to the zoo. Well, we got there, and uh, for a little private zoo, it was really quite nice. I mean, this man that owned it took us, gave us a private tour through his little zoo, and he showed us his possums and his coons and his snakes and all the things that the little zoo had, and we, we enjoyed it very much. And, and when he got through and we were about to leave, he said, oh, one other thing I must show you. And so he took us and walked us back across the grounds over to a large tin building. And uh, we walked in the front door of that building, and there in the far end were two large cages 
and in one of them was a male lion, and the other was a female lion. And it didn't excite me. I've been to zoos and seen lions, you know, lots of times. And so it didn't particularly bother me. But uh, he just kind of quickened his pace and walked off and left us and walked over to that cage where that great big old male lion was, and he pulled the pin on the door and opened it, and that lion come walking out of there, and that excited me. <laughs> you know, and, and he said now, he said, don't let it bother you. He said, he's just as tame as a kitten. And sure enough, the old lion was. He'd just walk up to you and rub against you, and you could pull on his mane just as tame as could be, folks. This is the way the animals will be in heaven. There won't be any that will be vicious. They'll be tame, and you and I can enjoy what God has created, all the wonderful things that will be there, and our children will enjoy them. This will be heaven to God's people down through the ages, a place that God has prepared for you and for me. And it says, there shall be no more night there. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them the light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So, there in that city, God will be there. In fact, it says that he will make his home with us. Think about it. This little old planet that for centuries has been desecrated by sin will be cleansed and will become the home. A home of God actually will become the center of the universe. And all these people, all these people that have said, yes, you're my God. I will be your people. All those people will become witnesses to the entire universe of what the grace of God can do on the human heart. Never again, never again, throughout eternity, will there ever be a question as to what the grace of God can do and the sacrifice that God would make for any individual. He has done that for you. He's done that for me. We can have life. We can have eternal life. Not because we deserve it. Not because of something we have done. But because Jesus Christ came, made it available to you and to me. Oh, dear friend tonight, I hope and I pray that you will make this your home. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much for all that you have done. As we've taken a look at what your word has described heaven for us, Lord, take our minds off this old world. Help us to get our minds and our attention away from these things and put them on you that we might prepare our hearts and our lives to walk with you and to follow you, to be there in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that it won't be for a day or for two or for a year, but throughout eternity we will be able to enjoy all the wonderful things that you have made for your people. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we finish up in our next presentation this on the Elijah message, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There is coming a day soon, friends, very soon, in which Jesus is coming back. What am I to expect? How can I be prepared for that day? That's what we'll look at in our next presentation. We hope each of you can be there for it. Thank you very much for being here, for watching by television or listening on the radio. Good night. God bless you. 
Although they're small and seemingly insignificant, soybean pods fill the farm fields of the United States. What a treasure they are for the farmer at harvest time. Nearly all soybeans in this country are processed for their oil, which is then refined for cooking or sold for biodiesel production, as well as for many other industrial uses. Because of the high demand for soybeans, a farmer must be able to harvest large quantities in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. One of the best ways to do this is to use a combined harvester. These massive machines give the farmer the ability to quickly harvest and hull the beans at an incredible rate. Have you ever considered what one farmer can do today with the help of modern tools? The farmer of the past could hardly imagine it. Within hours, one man and a machine can harvest and deliver untold bushels of soybeans to the market. His goal is to obtain the largest yield possible at harvest time. Like the farmer today, we must do the same. In Luke 10 and verse 2, Jesus said the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. And in John 4:35, he looked over the wheat fields and said to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. In both passages, Jesus referred to men and women of this world as he proclaimed that the harvest is here and the work must be done. When I was a boy, the corn harvest was all done by hand. We literally had a horse-drawn wagon, and we would walk along beside it and pull the corn off the stalk and throw it onto the wagon. But folks, the time is short, so the Lord has provided the most marvelous technology to enable us to harvest more souls through television, radio, and other media. Today, we can take the message to the multitudes around the world at the speed of light. Such ability was far beyond the imagination of the evangelist of the past. The harvest is here, but we can't do it without you. Won't you help us? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television and radio. Your gifts help bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. Give Me the Bible broadcasts are available on DVD. Each individual program of the Elijah Message series may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire five-part series, including The Coming of Elijah, Abraham's Altar, Bless This House, Heaven is My Home, and Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord may be ordered as a set for a total of $49.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. You may also order online at kennethcoxministries.org. Give me the Bible on DVD, each message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. Give Me the Bible broadcasts are available on DVD. Each individual program of the Elijah Message series may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire five-part series, including The Coming of Elijah, Abraham's Altar, Bless This House, Heaven is My Home, and Great and Dreadful Day of the Lord may be ordered as a set for a total of $49.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. You may also order online at kennethcoxministries.org.
Give Me the Bible on DVD. Each message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. Although they're small and seemingly insignificant, soybean pods fill the farm fields of the United States. What a treasure they are for the farmer at harvest time. Nearly all soybeans in this country are processed for their oil, which is then refined for cooking or sold for biodiesel production, as well as for many other industrial uses. Because of the high demand for soybeans, a farmer must be able to harvest large quantities in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. One of the best ways to do this is to use a combined harvester. These massive machines give the farmer the ability to quickly harvest and hull the beans at an incredible rate. Have you ever considered what one farmer can do today with the help of modern tools? The farmer of the past could hardly imagine it. Within hours, one man in a machine could harvest and deliver untold bushels of soybeans to the market. His goal is to obtain the largest yield possible at harvest time. Like the farmer today, we must do the same. In Luke 10 and verse 2, Jesus said the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. And in John 4:35, he looked over the wheat fields and said to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. In both passages, Jesus referred to men and women of this world as he proclaimed that the harvest is here and the work must be done. When I was a boy, the corn harvest was all done by hand. We literally had a horse-drawn wagon, and we would walk along beside it and pull the corn off the stalk and throw it onto the wagon. But folks, the time is short, so the Lord has provided the most marvelous technology to enable us to harvest more souls through television, radio, and other media. Today, we can take the message to the multitudes around the world at the speed of light. Such ability was far beyond the imagination of the evangelist of the past. The harvest is here, but we can't do it without you. Won't you help us? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television and radio. Your gifts help bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world.